Hey all, Max here, and it's the end of day five, which means it's the end of week one of the 30-day sprint. So what have I gotten done since the last update? The big headline is that we launched Starlens. So Starlens is the new name of the GitHub Profile Analyzer, and we launched that this morning. Now we were going to launch to Product Hunt, but we missed the deadline by about nine minutes. And by we, I mean I. So we're gonna launch that on Product Hunt on Monday at 9 a.m. CEST. Lost some time this week to some issues in WeWeb. The WeWeb team got online with me after hours and unblocked me there. So massive, massive shout out to Slavo and in particular to Joyce for doing a lot of the legwork on that. I really appreciate it, guys. But one learning that came from that is I think I'm going to have to mitigate how much time I spend on the UIs of anything that I ship. Because again, the goal here, and I think what's most interesting to everyone here is how is the AI part working? How's automation working with AI? So next week, when we're scoping things, I'm gonna definitely keep that in mind. I had a few folks reach out to me and tell me I should check out Cursor, uh, which is basically an IDE that's AI powered. But back to Starlens, what else? One of the first realizations you know, I had was that every time someone's gonna be invoking the results route to see an individual page, they're going to be hitting our LLMs. Now, and it ends running really fast, it's the LLM steps that are taking a long time. And there's not much that I can do that about that. I can maybe shave off a few seconds, but either way, it's something we've already calculated. So the solution to that was putting a cache on it. Now you can do caches on the front end, but since I had end end working and I never built a cache before, I took a stab at building a backend cache powered by end end and Superbase. So later in this video, I have a bit more details on setting it up, but the, the TLDR of that is, again, I max the cache, I'm not an engineer, and at about 28 minutes, 25 minutes, I launched a cache to production. I felt like a superhero today just by doing that. There were a few less sections in Starlands than I had anticipated at first. But one great result, I think, of being nimble is the filters that came out of it. So you can now modify the LLM queries and you can send some text that modifies the prompts. You can have it talk to you as a pirate or Steve Buscemi. And so I think that level of interactivity is also gonna perhaps pique people's interest to clone it. Pretty happy with that result, especially given this is the first time I'm doing a build in public thing like this. One thing I realized, I don't have an export of WeWeb right now. I'm considering what to do with that because I want the whole project to be clonable. So what I did meanwhile is I quickly duplicated the backend workflow. I simplified it down and I added a form trigger and a neat way to respond to that form trigger, which I wrote with ChatGPT. So you can today set up that template without paying a single euro, without having a single access to a credit card and go check that out. So I highly, highly recommend that. More details in the rest of this video. The one thing that took a back seat to shipping Starlands was the AI newsletter. So next week, I plan to have that go out next Friday. I think it's almost a blessing in disguise because we're gonna have two weeks of artifacts of me posting in the Notion, in the Twitter, on my LinkedIn, the video transcripts from these videos. So I think we're gonna have a lot more data to play with and that people would actually want to read. And then one thing I shipped this week, it wasn't necessarily a project for my board, but I was manually updating the day counter on the Notion page. I thought that's pretty ridiculous given I work at an automation company. So I set up a really quick workflow to automate that. And now that's 27 times where I won't have to do that. It literally took me two, three minutes to set up. I think I myself need to get in a better habit of automating even the little stuff. I think I even sent a tweet about needing to do it. That tweet might have taken the same amount of time as just doing it. So next week on some ops stuff that comes up, I'm gonna jump on that grenade and just automate it out in the spirit of automating everything. The other two places where I'm manually updating right now, that kind of information is my Twitter and my LinkedIn. So with those systems, they lock down the APIs a bit more, but I'll do the legwork of figuring out how I get in there and make it easy so then you guys can more easily get into your own Twitters and your own LinkedIn's and start automating some of the stuff that you need to do as well. And then the meetings with Oscar and Devin, they got pushed next week. No stress, gave me actually some time to focus on the style lens and a few issues we had around that. So excited to meet with them next week, pick some things to build and go build them. And so before we get into the more detailed updates at the end of this video that kind of goes into what I've been working on the last couple of days, 
I just want to mention a quick PSA that the 30 day AI sprint notion page is the single source of truth, the home base for any links, artifacts, projects related to this. So if you're curious what I'm working on, you can go in there. It's got my public project board where you see what I'm working on. I got to try and figure out some public voting on that. Don't have that yet. On Twitter, I'm doing my more frequent updates. On LinkedIn, I've also got some cut downs of my content. But that Notion page is the thing where you're going to get the most meaty info if you're interested in replicating what I'm working on. So for the rest of this video, you're going to see what I worked on since the last update. Last night, I had quite the build session. Let's take a look. Uh, we're in WeWeb right now. And I've pivoted the idea a little bit. One way we can make this interesting for users is to give them really interesting summaries, right? But I think something that could make it a bit more interactive and something that's easy to do in NN is to add some of these modifiers that re-trigger the request to the NN workflow, send along uh, this information, and then modify and update this response below. So I've updated it to where it has a default voice, there's a pirate voice, and then maybe Steve Buscemi and Reservoir Dogs. These then inject a prompt in my NN workflow. So what's happening in this workflow, we can see here I've added a switch node that basically is checking if this AI model parameter is Claude 3.5 Sonnet or Llama 3.18B. If it's Claude, we route to one or output zero, otherwise to output one, and we have a fallback. So if it's not set, if it's sent as a null from the front end, I don't know, it could happen in initial state, even though uh, I did set an initial value, then it'll fall back to Claude. One thing we could probably do, these outputs, not named right now. So let's just name these real quick. So Claude 3.5 and number three. And what I've done so far is I've just duplicated the AI step um, and routed it to here. In the respond to webhook node, that's okay because um, what I'm doing is when you're doing something like this, where you have two possible routes, it's important to check that you're basically using like a relative way to reference expression data. So here we see dollar JSON. We don't see anything with a node name in it itself, because obviously if we were checking for this node name and we run through here, this node name is not going to have any data. So do use relative ways to reference your data like dollar JSON when you're having an approach like this. In a more scalable approach, we could also not have a switch node, but instead be changing something in a single model. For example, this here could also be set as an expression. If I change that, we would just have to provide this value in an expression to, to run this model. If you're not sure how to discover what these values sometimes are, what I do is get four values here, go like this, hit expression, go like this, hit expression. Although I just realized we have this ellipsis menu. There's not a lot of stuff here. We could probably add a quick little action that allows you to copy all the possible values. So I'll add that to the product ideas board. In any case, so for Anthropic, that might not be the best node to do that because there's only four options here. But with something like Brock might be what I do first because Brock has a free plan and again, has a lot of different models. So we could go that route as well. In any case, that's sending that back. Uh, to the front end, and I've also added some loading states. So what's happening is there's a variable I've created in here called show dynamic content. It's a bool, true, false. And then basically the visibility of these sections is false by default. And the workflow attached to this dropdown in here, I have a workflow. It runs the fetch profile analysis and it has this change variable value to true, false. Now, one thing that is not ideal here, I think also for maybe some developers who might be using this project, right? I have a workflow set up for this one and for this one. They're two separate workflows. I might not be doing it properly in WeWeb, but my inner engineer brain doesn't really like that. It's duplication. Uh, either way, we got it working. But one thing I am going to probably try and do is check out Cursor uh, and code out some of my next front ends because I'm hearing some great things uh, from you guys about that. So thanks so much for that feedback. What I'm gonna have to do next is I've got these various sections. A few moments later. Projects to show love, AI agent that basically knows how to browse new projects because these, these are projects that they've already liked, right? We're taking their interests and showing them projects that have a lot of users that are popular but don't have a lot of contributors. So maybe they could contribute because that's a big problem in, in OSS or can be sometimes. 
right? Your profile means no real idea what we'll do here yet. Probably going to get these scope. Um, but a stretch goal for me is to have some kind of generative images, vision, that kind of thing. And then recent PR summarized by a VC. This is a late night idea I had basically takes your most recent PR. A VC needs to pitch your PR as if it were the hottest new startup. So we could have some fun with that, but let's time box each one of these and see how quickly we can make them. Looking at the different ones, I think the project to show love is the first one I'm going to start off at because it's in GitHub ecosystem already. I've already got the GitHub creds. To do that, we're going to do this as a sub workflow because I've got my workflow already built right here. Now we do have the version, let's save that. I do have the versions feature, so I could flip between the different versions and roll back. But what I'd like to do is have these be modular. So I have a bit of a cleaner workflow also that I can update for example, individual sections without risking bugs in the rest of the workflow when we're live. And potentially if we hit scale, a lot of people start using this, we might turn off a section if it's, you know, adding 50% to the load time, or if it's a sub workflow, we can more easily, for example, maybe this one's really expensive to run or effortful. What we could do, maybe a lot of people won't even get down to this page so that we could have a button to run that and it runs a separate workflow. So it's just going to be a bit easier if we already set that up as a separate workflow because in it and we can have workflows that run other workflows. We call them sub workflows. So it's pretty easy to do. Here's my process. Anytime I'm building a sub workflow and I already have a parent workflow built because you're going to need some data in the sub workflow to be able to do all your different mappings for expressions. So I go into executions. I get an execution that's representative of the kind of data that I'd like to use in my sub workflow. I click copy to editor. This loads all the data from that execution in my editor. And then for example, I'll pick the node after which I want my sub workflow to run. So let's say I want my sub workflow to run in this step. I will take the merge node. I can use the edit feature here. I see the output. This is the output of the merge node. I want to send all of this to the sub workflow. So we'll select all. We don't need to pin this, so we'll cancel. And then I'll go, I will save that. We'll go to my project here. We'll create a new workflow. This is my find new projects. We can rename that later and make it a bit better. And because it's a sub workflow, we need to use the execute workflow trigger from the home screen. It's also when called by another workflow here. So I'll click on that. This doesn't have a payload right now. It's not really connected yet to the other workflow. So what I'll do in here is I'll paste in the payload. And since I want this to be an AI tool, I mentioned this in one of my more in-depth videos on AI tool agents. But what I need to do is go in here that will send when it invokes this tool, when it calls this workflow, it's going to send along everything that's sending in a top level query key. So we'll do that. And we're showing an error because each and an item, this is the top level array. This is what the, the payload of the node, each top level edit an item needs to be within quotes itself. Um, I guess at the bottom here also. And yeah, so now we have a top level query item, uh, with everything in here or rather top level query object in here. This is the exact same schema as when a different workflow will call this or the workflow that we intend uh, to call this. It has the same schema now. So from here, rather easy to build out the rest of my workflow, which is first going to probably be an HTTP request to the GitHub API to, uh, fetch some relevant information. A few minutes later, I'm now working on the AI agent and I just have gotten it to, let's see, I am adding some placeholders right now. I've just gotten it to work with some static data. So, so what do I mean by that? Let's have this run. Actually, let's, let's connect some memory as well, but basically, so what this workflow is doing is it's prompt is you a helpful assistant tasked with taking input from the user and recommending public GitHub repos to them. And then in the user prompt with the text going in, can you recommend five public GitHub projects based on my interests, my programming interests? I'm then taking the topics input that's coming from my parent workflow and just doing a join on that uh, so that it comes out as a CSV in, in the, the actual rendered result that sends to the LLM. So my current status is that I've gotten, let's see, let's update this. This is search repos. I've gotten the tool working with static data. That is, um, I'm sending the query parameters, the search criteria statically. I was having a bit of trouble 
more on the GitHub side because it was this URL encoding stuff. What I'll recommend is if you're having trouble setting up an HTTP request tool, first have it work completely static and don't add placeholder definitions. These are the placeholders are the things that your AI is allowed to swap out in the query parameters and other parameters that you make in the API call. But now that I've got this working, as we can see, it's outputting. Um, now I'm going to expose to the eye the placeholders that it can manipulate. So I'll add those like this. In this uh, here, for example, search query. And here, what I'll do is that in curly braces. And now I just have to give a description for search query. I could define the type, but I haven't yet. I haven't locked that down. It's worked fine every time so far. And then my AI agent will then know that it can manipulate search query, but not, for example, these things here. One thing I do recommend when you're writing descriptions for these sorts of things, and generally when you're stuck, I've been using GPT a lot. So one example is for coming up with even just the query from GitHub, and then also for the explanations for my placeholders. I need to generate a lot of mock data or example data for LLMs. A lot of people are talking about using synthetic data these days. I guess this would be a form of synthetic data, right? It's, we have an LLM writing a description for an AI agent, which is using an LLM on how to use a tool. And so far, the results have been gangbusters. So let's keep building. A few inches later. I've made some changes on the back end. And so now I'm testing on the front end to make sure it's all working. And a great case came up that I want to show you. So I just refreshed the page, it's loading. Uh, but what had happened is when I was interacting with this one here, Pirate Voice was working, but the Steve Buscemi one didn't seem to be doing anything. And so I go into my edit and workflow, I look at my executions. This is the execution from that case where I was troubleshooting. We can see a new one's coming in because, um, see, there we is, it just finished. But the one I was looking at in here, if we take a look, this is the execution that ran. If I go into the, the Claude step in here, if I open up the text, so we can see a snapshot of what happened when it ran. And we see this is the additional instructions using a ternary operator to basically check what type, what voice type was set to. So in here we see it's sieve B reservoir. And we see when I was mocking this out, I wrote just Steve Buscemi. So that's why if I go down here, additional instructions is evaluating to none. And that's why we're not getting a Steve Buscemi voice. So I, what I can do is, copy this execution to editor. This preloads the output data from the exec into my workflow. Um, and then from here, I can go in with the data from that run, with that context, go in here, update this to my key name here, which is, or to the value for voice type that I received here, the reservoir, and I can check it too. Great, that's working now. Let's test it. Steve Buscemi here, go to executions, and let's see if it returns in Steve Buscemi voice. By the way, since I've added the sub workflows and the AI agents, the total load time is around 25, 30 seconds right now. We can cut that down a little bit with some effort, but then I think what we'll have to do is we'll have some of the simpler sections and then for the more complicated sections, we'll load those asynchronously. This is post-launch and perhaps have those asynchronous ones only trigger when a user scrolls to that position. So we're being efficient. Okay, so since it's Steve Buscemi voice, before I scroll down, you know, being generated by, by AI. So I'm not sure what you're going to about to see, but yes, it looks like it's, it looks like it's working. Yay. So great example of how I can quickly troubleshoot something, load in the data from that execution into NAN, save it. And since this is, I'm working with my production workflow here, I can just go back in, refresh, and yeah, keep building. Tomorrow. We did a soft launch of Starlens, and I just realized on the homepage, if I go to it, that here in the GitHub username, I don't have much front end validation. Now, one of the first things when I was typing on my iPhone, I realized that it's upper casing. Uh, the first character by default, so we're probably on mobile going to have quite a few people 
are going with an uppercase. So I've got my workflow open here. I'm going to open this here where we need to use that handle in the call. And then I'm just going to go to lowercase. I'm going to have a look in this one as well and see if I need it here. Yes. To lowercase. And now basically it's deployed to production. I've got my pinned webhook data here. So I could run this and test this before I hit save. I could also revert as well. Um, so I have everything I need to be making these changes quickly on launch day. Great example of using NN in the wild. 12 seconds later. So I just launched Starlens. So if I go on the internet, it's live. Now, if the backend workflow running it crashes, this one, if there's a problem with it, I'm not going to get an alert right now. So what I'm going to do is go to the settings here, settings, make sure that I have my error workflow selected on an error workflow. I called mine error workflow, but this can be any workflow on your end in an instance. And then let's build that workflow real quick, a real MVP one. So I'll go in here into error workflow. I'll add the error trigger. This trigger will fire when the, when the workflow runs. So this trigger could even be in the same workflow. I don't recommend it though, because then it's harder because the workflow is calling itself. They don't have unique names. Anyhow, I'll open this up, fetch test event. This is an example of the data that will be available to me from the parent flow. So we see we've got the URL, the execution, the error message and stuff. I'm going to add a Slack node, send message. I'm going to select my existing credential. I'm going to send a message to a channel. I set up a channel in Slack here, Project Starlens. I'm going to copy the channel ID and we're going to say by ID for the channel to select it. And then I'm going to set expression mode on here and let's write uh, the message and we'll combine data from here. So star lens in and then I'll get the workflow name. Workflow new line and then let's just print, let's say URL. I'll do that in there. Last node executed. This will be helpful because I can start seeing some patterns. If I see 10 in a row fail at the same node or at different nodes, I'll understand there's maybe different things going on. And then lastly, we've got the URL and then error message. Okay, um, let's test this. Sweet. Now we can see here, I can even open up the workflow that ran this. So this is going to open up the, the error workflow itself. I don't have to activate this. Error workflows do not need to be activated. They'll run automatically. I just need to save it. And now we're going to get an alert if something goes wrong. A few moments later. What I'm currently working on is converting the workflow into a simplified version that runs with the edit and form trigger. So this is going to allow a lot more folks to try this out faster without having to rig up some sort of webhook thing to consume it. In doing so, it was outputting the webhook response. Since that's JSON, that was looking like this. So I went into ChatGPT and I basically told it, here's my JSON output from the node currently. I gave it that. This is the input that I'm giving in here. That is this here that I sent in. So it knows the expression syntax that we're using. I then piped in the current output. This is what I'm getting here. And it gave me a version that wasn't working because it was using some sort of syntax to iterate over. I'm guessing liquid or something. And then I basically replied that it should be static because it wasn't working. And it outputted this. I popped that in to my respond to form trigger here. And this is what it generated. Wild, wild stuff. One eternity later. After all the work this week and shipping style ends, I definitely think I've owed myself a beer. So I'll catch you next week for another week of the 30-day AI sprint. Schönes Wochenende.